Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats. Good morning. Long time no see. <laughs> the devotional today will be led by Representative Caleb Elder of Starksboro. Members, it is hard to believe that it's been six weeks and that is our page's last day here. It is my privilege to recognize and express gratitude to this group of legislative pages and for their invaluable contributions to this session. As legislative pages, you serve a crucial role in our legislative process as you carry out essential tasks such as facilitating conversations, documenting proceedings, and ultimately, that ultimately lead to the creation of laws. Your service in the State House has left a big mark on the walls and these chambers of this great institution, and you will forever be part of the history of the 2024 legislative session. 
And just like the pages who have come before you, you are now part of the Vermont legislative family. I hope that your time here has been enriching and that you've had the opportunity to learn new things, to explore all the nooks and crannies of this historic building and observe the legislative process firsthand. Moreover, I hope that you have formed meaningful relationships with your fellow pages and legislators and that you will remain connected to this institution for years to come. You all have bright futures ahead of you, and we can't thank you enough for your service to the legislature and to the state of Vermont. The doors of the State House are always open. On behalf of all the members of the House, we hope you come visit soon. Thank you so much for your service. At this time, I will call each page up um, to receive their pen and to take a photograph. Uh, so if you can please hold your applause till the end and we'll thank them one more time. Uh, James Ashley Carr of Montpelier. Burke Donovan of St. Johnsbury. Willa Keck of New Haven. Emerson Morrill of Virgins. Elliday Orr of Baston. And Guinevere Velto of Springfield. <laughs> Members, please join me in giving them another round of applause. Members, we have received notice that Representative, Representative Emma Mulvaney Stanick of Burlington is resigning from the House. Please listen to the reading of Representative Mulvaney Stanick's resignation letter. Dear Speaker Krowinski and Clerk Rask, on March 5th, 2024, I won my election to become the next mayor of Burlington. This is a joyous moment in my public service career. I will be the first woman to serve in this role in the city's 159 year history. I will also be the first out LGBTQ plus person to ever serve in this role. It is also a bittersweet moment as I must resign as a member of the House of Representatives in order to effectively serve the city. My resignation will be effective as of April 1st, 2024. Very few Vermonters earn the privilege of serving as a member of the House of Representatives. I consider my almost two terms representing the people of Chittenden 17 to be one of my proudest moments. I also feel proud of my work serving as the leader of the small but mighty House Progressive Caucus. I'm proud of the role our caucus plays in this body to expand our collective capacity to consider what is truly possible and what is needed to solve the complex problems facing our state. Thank you to my progressive colleagues. I would like to extend my appreciation and gratitude to the entire House leadership team over my tenure. In 2021, the Vermont House made history by electing women to every House leadership role, including our very skilled House clerk. I'm just reading this letter. <laughs> no. uh, I am honored.
honored to have been part of this continued historic pattern of leadership in the Vermont House. I appreciate my colleagues on the Vermont, on the House Commerce and Economic Development Committee and our ability to work towards compromise as a tripartisan body. I learned a great deal alongside my committee leaders and colleagues, and I am proud of our work to elevate issues of equity for workers, businesses owned by marginalized community members, and Vermonters using our unemployment and workers' compensation programs. The legislative and state house staff, who are essential to the work of any legislator, each of the employees holds themselves to a high level of professionalism and commit to high quality work. Legislators are extremely fortunate to, long, to work alongside these Vermonters. Thank you all for your work and service to our state. Finally, and most importantly, I would like to extend my appreciation to my family, my wife, Megan, and my young children, Ruby and Elliot. Each of our families plays a critical role in supporting everyone serving in this body. My family has been tremendously patient with the long hours missed bedtimes and school events, and the economic strain on our household from this job's low salary and lack of benefits. I look forward to a day where this incredible job becomes more accessible to working people and to Vermonters with small children being able to serve. Our legislature will be a stronger, healthier, and more representative body for all Vermonters if we fairly compensate legislators and adopt rules that reflect modern times. Thank you again for the honor to serve Vermonters. Peace, Emma. We thank the member from Burlington for her service. <laughs> Members, we have seven Senate bills for referral today. The first is Senate Bill 98, which is an act relating to Green Mountain Green Mountain Care Board Authority over prescription drug cost introduced by Senator Rom Hinsdale and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-98, an act relating to Green Mountain Care Board Authority over prescription drug costs. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Health Care. Senate Bill 114 is an act relating to the establishment of the Psychedelic Therapy Advisory Working Group introduced by Senator Gulick and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-114, an act relating to the establishment of the Psychedelic Therapy Advisory Working Group. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Human Services. Senate Bill 112, 120 rather, is an act relating to post-secondary schools and sexual misconduct protections introduced by Senator Hashim. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-120, an act relating to post-secondary schools and sexual misconduct protections. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Education. Senate Bill 192 is an act relating to forensic facility admissions criteria and processes introduced by Senator Lyons and Sears. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-192, an act relating to forensic facility admissions criteria and processes. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Human Services. Next is Senate Bill 204, which is an act relating to supporting Vermont's young readers through evidence-based literacy instruction. Introduced by Senator Gulick and others, please listen to the first reading of the bill. S204, an act relating to supporting Vermont's young readers through evidence-based literary instruction. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Education. Next is Senate Bill 220, which is an act relating to Vermont Public Libraries, introduced by Senator Hardy and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S220, an act relating to Vermont's public libraries. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. <coughs> Finally, Senate Bill 254 is an act relating to including rechargeable batteries and battery containing products under the State Battery Stewardship Program introduced by Senator Bray and others. Please listen to the first reading of the bill. S-254, an act relating to including rechargeable batteries and battery containing products under the State Battery Stewardship Program. Now the bill has been read the first time and is referred to the Committee on Environment and Energy. Are there any announcements? Member from Starksboro. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, it was an honor to play the devotional today. I always love getting to do this uh, once a session. But today I was joined by a group of friends, uh, bluegrass friends. I've been playing bluegrass in Vermont for 25 years. Um, I played in the Vermont Youth Orchestra for years and then 
realized when I was 19 that bluegrass was a much better fit for me personally. Uh, and I have been part of a warm community in Vermont. Um, when I was 19, I went to Borders Music in Burlington, uh, having just started to play and picked out some old-fashioned CDs, the David Grisman Retrospective, uh, John Harford's Aeroplane, and Matt Flinner's The View From Here. Uh, Matt Flinner is playing mandolin today. He's from Ripton. We claimed him from Nashville, oh, I don't know, about a decade ago. And Matt has long been one of my musical heroes. That um, song we played is his own song from uh, the album The View From Here. It's called Black's Fork. Um, so, yeah, as one of Matt's biggest fans, I'm just going to gush a little and say I can't believe I got to play with him and, and play this tune that I've had rattling around my head for over two decades. Um, Secondly, Pat Melvin was playing bass. Uh, Pat and I have kids the same age. We both live in Starksboro. And um, Pat is the fourth member of the Vermont Mandolin Trio. Uh, ironically, there's four people in the band, but I think only the mandolin players count. Um, but, you know, mandolin players aren't known for their math skills, and Pat is the only engineer in the band. So I'll just leave it there. Um, the third member of our group is Willie Watson from St. Albans. And I met Willie... Um, when my uh, when my father-in-law Jim McGinnis uh, passed, and um, Willie now plays Jim's guitar, and uh, that little bit of serendipity uh, is welcome. So thank you, Jim, and thank you, Willie, for being here. Um, lastly. Also, sitting with the band in the gallery is a friend I met when playing with the Queen City Cut-Ups who came up and joined us on stage named Drew Stripe. And he's here with his son, uh, Sam, today. They also just moved up from Nashville and were excited to see the Vermont legislative process. And um, so I'd ask you, as we say the Bluegrass Festivals, Madam Speaker, please make them welcome. Will the guests of the member from Starksboro please rise and be recognized? member from Rutland City. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today is a uh, member in this well's birthday from Burlington, Troy Hendrick, or in the committee as we like to call him, Captain Aardbark. Let's all come together and Happy express birthday. our birthday wishes to Troy Hendrick. Thank you. Happy birthday, member. <laughs> member from Hyde Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On Disability Awareness Day, it is my pleasure to introduce my brother-in-law, Jeremy Carpenter, who is here with his friends and caregiver and providers from Upper Valley Service. I have been lucky enough to know Jeremy since we were teenagers. As a child, Jeremy was one of the first students with developmental disabilities in Vermont to attend public school. He was mainstream, that's what they called it back then. Jeremy attended Barrytown Elementary School and graduated from Spalding High School. He currently lives independently in Montpelier with his dear friend and shared living provider, Gwen. He works at the Recycling Collection Center and is a Special Olympics basketball player and fantastic bowler. Finally, when I asked Jeremy what he would like me to share about him today, he said he would like you to know that his nickname is the Master of Mayhem and that he wants people with disabilities to be respected and treated fairly. Would the body please join me in welcoming Jeremy and Gwen to the People's House? Thank you. Will the family and guests of the member from Hyde Park please rise and be recognized? Member from Standard. Madam Speaker, today, um, today I rise um, on the 29th day of March, which is designated by our governor as Vietnam Veterans Day. And as the only one left in the House that served in Vietnam, I think it's important to keep the oral history alive from those of us who experienced it. And so today, you know, in the last two years, I kind of gave a lot of statistics and a lot of history on the war. Today, it's a little bit more personal for me. So I'd like to talk a, a little bit, if the body will indulge me for a little bit longer, um, what it was like to be a 19-year-old middle-class kid um, who was turned into a soldier warrior 
by or through the training that I received uh, by the U.S. military. From the first day that I entered basic training in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, I was taught it was kill or be killed. You know, you really, you might be able to imagine what this was like, but you can't really understand it unless you experienced it. We attacked straw-filled dummies um, uh, with bayonets yelling, kill, kill, kill. We were taught to dehumanize the enemy, the Vietnamese people. They weren't Vietnamese people. They were gooks, zips, dinks, all kinds of derogatory terms that you used. And why did that happen, Madam Speaker? It happened so that it was easier to take the life of another human being. It's very difficult. And the aftermath is intense. So I realized that I had to be a good soldier. And I was. And I learned everything that I could. And I shipped to Fort Lewis, Washington, where it was always dark and rainy <laughs> for some reason. I don't know. But, you know, we, we, we crawled under barbed wire with live rounds being shot over our head for training. And I learned well. And I fought a personal war of survival. And I won that war because I'm standing here right now today. But the aftermath was difficult. And unless you can, again, understand what it's like to have someone out there that was absolutely determined to take your life, to kill you, and you the same, absolutely determined that you won't, your life won't be lost, but you are willing and able to take the life of other human beings. It's really uh, an amazing thing that you can only experience if you experience mortal combat. But the aftermath was severe. I returned to an ungrateful nation in the dark hours of the morning in November 1967. And I met my parents at Grand Central Station. No parades, no anything. As a matter of fact, we were told to take our uniforms off uh, when, we, when we landed. And I lived the next 12 years of my life before post-traumatic stress was recognized as a disorder in the DSM-3 in 1981. And that 12 years, it was unbelievable. There was no love. There was no hate. There was no empathy. There was no sympathy. Just a lot of anger and a lot of hate. And you lived 12 years with that. Relationships didn't matter because there was no love. There was nothing. I was an emotional flatliner for 12 years. Felt nothing. Until post-traumatic stress was discovered or, dis or recognized, and I started therapy. And 30 years of therapy after that, I feel like I'm a whole person. And I serve here for 10 years. And I understand and I empathize with people. And I can do that where I couldn't do it in the 19, late 1960s. It didn't happen. So I just asked the body to understand that and to recognize that I'm not the only one that struggled. There were, were 550,000 soldiers serving in, in Vietnam by 1968-69. And I told this the last two years, in one, one week in 1968, 220 soldiers were killed. That's everyone in this room. Amen. Gone in one week. So I don't want to take too much time. We're running late, and I, and I really hope that we can uh, just understand a little bit about what this experience was, because it was intense. And there was a, I wear my trappings today from my military experience. And you know, at one point, Madam Speaker, I probably would have thrown them over the fence in the fire. But I wear them proudly now because I've overcome that. And I want, every, I want to remind myself what this is about and everyone else in the room. So 
I would like to just ask for a moment of silence, Madam Speaker, for the 58,220 of my brothers and sisters that didn't return. Members, will you please join me in a moment of silence? Are there any further announcements? Member from Colchester. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Vietnam veterans had to fight three wars, one overseas, one when they got home, and one inside. Their efforts ensured that following generations of veterans only had to fight one and a half. The one overseas, the one inside they got support for, and the one at home they didn't have to fight. So, member from Stoddard, and all Vietnam veterans, thank you. Are there any further announcements? Member from Hartford. Madam Speaker, I am delighted to welcome some of the fiercest, most compelling lobbyists known to Vermont to the building today. And that would be Youth Lobby. This group of students has a particular interest in understanding how Vermont can best equip itself to tackle the crisis of climate change through policy. There are about 30 students seated in the balcony with a bright earth sticker on from Essex, Harwood, Northfield, Norwich, and Woodstock. I hope you'll take an opportunity today to say hello, hear their perspectives, and perhaps reflect on how you, we, are holding ourselves accountable and fighting alongside them for a healthier planet. Thanks for your help in welcoming these young Vermonters to the People's House. Will the guests of the member from Hartford please rise and be recognized? Are there any further announcements? Seeing none, orders of the day. Members, I want to give you an update on bill order. We are going to start with House Bill 883, uh, making appropriations for the support of government. Then we'll turn to, we'll go head back to the top of the calendar with H875 and then S278. With that, we'll turn to House Bill 883, which is an act relating to making appropriations for the support of government. Prior to third reading, the member from Northfield, Representative Donahue, offers an amendment to the bill that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Northfield. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as referenced, the uh, amendment is printed in today's calendar. Um, I am not going to do a walkthrough of the amendment. I am going to read the title, but I won't do a walkthrough because there is nothing in it that you have not already had a walkthrough, uh, have read, have seen, and in fact have uh, voted on. The title uh, it would add a new section to the budget, and the title is Fiscal Year 2025 One-Time Appropriations for Certain Provisions Enacted in 2024 Legislation. 
There is a fiscal memo that is available that has been posted and there are copies on the uh, center table. Um, what it does is simply add into our budget bill uh, the appropriations that were uh, created in the uh, judiciary, the Medicaid and the housing bills uh, that we have either uh, passed or are halfway through uh, passing uh, on the floor this week. Madam Speaker, when I do a budget, when I consider my uh, costs for the year ahead and I budget my expenses, I include, I think most of us include, all of our spending intentions, what we intend, what we intend to spend in that year ahead. Our spending intentions as a body based on our votes are at this point a bit over nine billion because we have a budget in front of us at 8.8 .8 billion, but we have also voted on bills adding 26 million, the three that I just referenced. That is what we are sending to the Senate as our proposed appropriations. Yet our budget says that we are budgeting 8.8 .8 billion. Madam Speaker, I believe it's disingenuous and misleading to our public. And I think it's the transparency to the public that's most important here. This amendment makes no difference at all to the bottom line of this body's votes. It simply places the 25.75 million in those three bills into, attached to as part of the budget that we're passing. Now, Madam Speaker, I understand that given the way we uh, proceeded this year, which is unique and different from uh, previous years, it would be more complicated, will be more complicated uh, for internal purposes um, for the body, for our, our support staff, because it will mean tracking and making sure the Senate doesn't double appropriate uh, both in the bill and in the budget. But what's much more important to me is that it's more transparent to the public. And that is what this amendment is about because it results in a budget that is actually 25.75 million out of balance with all of our ex total budget uh, as passed, therefore demonstrating the need to raise the taxes that were in those three additional bills. It results in passing a budget, taking up for a vote this morning and passing a budget that reflects what we have actually voted on to spend, what we are appropriating in reality and asking our other body to take up as a budget for next year. They will ultimately need to be included in a budget that's voted on. They're not included now, and that makes it not transparent publicly as to what we're doing. As the uh, fiscal memo, it's not called a fiscal note because that only goes to a, a committee's bill. It's for a member, so it's a fiscal memo. Um, it notes that we're talking about 25.75 million this year, but note that that will become part of the new base. So pretending it's not part of the budget now uh, would not be transparent. And in fact, as I think we're all aware, uh, if the intent of those three bills is carried out next year, um, the intent that's in the policy bills and are not repealed next year, uh, in fiscal year 26, it'll be more than 131 million that will need to be added to the budget. It would seem that we should start off with the first amount that we intend and have voted on and passed to put it directly in the budget as our intended appropriation. 
So, Madam Speaker, I don't think we should be voting on a budget that pretends a certain amount of appropriations on the part of this body. I think we should pass, I think we should pass a budget that includes all of our appropriations intended. I think that that's the only way we can be transparent and upfront with our intentions in passing the budget today. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, I would uh, urge the body to adopt uh, this amendment that would achieve that goal. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Your House Appropriations Committee uh, met this morning and heard the amendment from the member from Northfield. And as typical fashion, uh, the representative uh, is is always accurate in making sure that wanting to make sure that the work that leaves this body both now and at the end of the session has its best foot forward and represents um, where we are. I do not disagree that transparency is the utmost of what we need to do with our work and our committee does believe that the approach right now is creates the most transparent and easy to track, the easiest way to track. If you recall yesterday, I had to stand up within the budget itself that we had an, uh, uh, caught an error after we, after we actually worked on Monday, after we'd been working on it for a while, where we're in language matters and it takes an enormous amount of staff time to keep up with tracking some of our actions that we almost inadvertently double uh, appropriated an item and I needed to stand up and rectify that with an amendment. Um, this particular year is, is unique that we have a lot going on. Um, but I would like to say that, you know, the House's work right now, it's March. We are sending over our work to the Senate as much as we believe, and I know uh, we always have to make that assumption that the work that we send over to the Senate is in such perfected state that there is no other reaction or uh, work that the body, other body needs to uh, take on our good work. But what I do know at this point of time, as the House goes first with any money, bills, revenue, that we are, not, we are only now within the budget and in the bills that we pass that are H particularly, um, just setting out the first steps of ideas. I do believe that by the time we come back here and uh, reconvene in May to finish up uh, the budget, there is going, it's going to look very different than the way that we're sending it over now. And I do believe that the bills that, other bills that have revenue and policy will be in a different state of being, uh, needing to be accounted for. I believe that it is at that time that we make sure that that accounting process takes place. So for the, because of the complexity of tracking any of, of these efforts and the risk, the risk of ending up double appropriating something uh, that we don't want to see happen, uh, your House Appropriations Committee voted on a um, vote of a straw vote of 11-1-0 to find this amendment unfavorable, at least at this time. 11 0 11 1 0 and we ask for you to um, support us and not supporting this amendment thank you so the question is shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from northfield member from northfield uh, madam speaker um, the member and i are in agreement in some areas um, I do agree that it may be more transparent internally for those who can follow. It took me a little while to catch up and understand uh, why our budget didn't reflect what we were actually uh, intending or desiring to spend. Um, but I don't think it is for the public. The public is being told that we are voting on and passing an $8.8 .8 billion budget. That is not what our intention as a body is to be appropriating 
and asking to spend this year. We have not done this before, and I don't think we should start doing it now, where we omit, omit significant amounts of money that we have voted on and said we want to spend, and yet not include it and vote for a pretend budget that's lower than the actual bills that we have passed. Madam Speaker, I don't think it's a surprise uh, to this body to hear that I think transparency to the public, to our constituents, constituents, is one of our most important obligations. I don't believe that this budget is a transparent budget of our intentions and what we're doing if it does not include that additional $25.25 million. Madam Speaker, because of the importance of this transparency, of this direct upfront information to our public, I would ask that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll. The member from Northfield requests that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll as the member sustained. The member is sustained. When the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. Member from Westford. Uh, Madam Speaker, point of inquiry, can you please just confirm what a yes vote and a no vote means on this amendment. Thank you. Uh, members, a yes vote is supporting the amendment being offered by the member from Northfield. Uh, a no vote is uh, declining the amendment from Northfield, from the member from Northfield. Member from Virgins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, although efforts are, 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 are worthy, at this time, this, uh, this amendment is premature for its actions, and I'm asking the body to please support the, your House Appropriations Committee's work to find this unfavorable and vote no. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Northfield? Are you ready for the question? Member from St. Johnsbury. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Less than 24 hours ago, we were told that for process reasons, um, an amendment from the member from Montpelier would not be allowed into the budget process for process reasons. Now we're told that an appropriation won't be allowed into the budget and instead was approved by a committee that has no authority to make appropriations because it wouldn't be allowed into the budget. Our contradictions continue to define us. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Northfield, member from Georgia? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I wanna point out that this, this amendment is important. It helps our work in its trend transparency and communicates to the people who are back home the honesty that we all uh, strive for. And I encourage you to support this amendment. Member from Pulteney. Madam Speaker, uh, the difficulty and the transparency involved in this is there's three joint fiscal office fiscal notes for the uh, several bills that uh, put uh, personal income tax and in one part of the corporate income tax and in two separate bills. Then we have the um, property transfer tax and yet another bill. I believe in transparency. And while $25, $26 million doesn't look like a lot this year, next year our budget's going to increase by $131 million because we passed these bills yesterday. So we're not looking at just $25 million. It will be $131 million come next year that will be included in our fiscal year budget through appropriations. So I will be voting yes on this bill. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Northfield? Member from Callis. Um, I rise. Uh, I was one of the no votes uh, on the committee, the Appropriations Committee. Um, I do think, and I think the committee generally thinks, that eventually 
all this money will be put together in one place in the budget, either certainly in next year's budget or possibly when the budget comes back from the Senate. But for now, I think, unfortunately, it would make things more complicated and less transparent to the public if we were to dump these three bills into the budget. It would be harder for JFO and harder for the Senate to try to disaggregate what's going on. But most importantly, we, I don't think, at least I, would not have voted this additional taxes but for the policy goals that the taxes is attached to in each of these three bills. For example, in housing, the budget itself, living within the confines of the income that we have, does almost nothing, doesn't do very much to address the huge housing problem we have. So we have created a bill and a set of income to go with it to really do something for once about housing. And I think it's more transparent to the public to know exactly what we are doing, that we are raising taxes for a reason, and the reason is stated in the bill. So I, I would urge you to vote no on the amendment. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Northfield, member from Northfield? Permission to speak a third time, Madam Speaker. Absent objection, you may. I just want to remind the body um, that the um, tax revenues to support specific initiatives, the desire to attach them to specific initiatives is not the way the process was set up because it is not a special fund that it's being raised for. Those taxes go into the special fund, or go into the general fund, and the initiatives would be paid out of the general fund. I understand that they were intended to match in what additional funding was needed in order to pay for them. That's exactly why they need to be in the general fund in our overall budget. They are not segregated uh, special funds. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Northfield? Member from Middlebury. Madam Speaker, I think we are all agreeing that transparency is important. I think we are defining it in different ways. Um, I uh, want to remind everybody that our committee vote was 11 one zero, um, unfavorable, and um, I think the member from Callis did an excellent job explaining that it keeps things cleaner, it keeps things very clear, it keeps the budget the budget. We don't know what's going to happen with all of these bills later, and I think it's premature to, to try to do this work now, and so I urge the body to vote no on this amendment. Thank you. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Northfield? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those, no, all, I didn't do it again. If so, will the clerk please call the roll? Andrews of Westford. No. Two minutes. Can I please see uh, House leadership up at the podium, please? Thank you.
Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats. Will the House please come to order. I would like to remind members that we are in the middle of a roll call vote. Members and guests are prohibited from using computers, phones, or any type of electronic device. Please refrain from the passing of notes and conversation during a roll call. And when the clerk calls your name, please answer in a loud and clear voice so the clerk can accurately record your vote. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Northfield? Will the clerk please continue to call the roll? Anthony of Berry City. No. Arison of Wethersfield. No. Arsena of Williston. No. Austin of Colchester. No. Bartholomew of Heartland. No. Bartley of Fairfax. Yes. Beck of St. Johnsbury. Yes. Rebecca of Winooski. No. Byron of Regens. No. Black of Essex. No. Bloomley of Burlington. No. Bongert of Manchester. No. Boslin of Westminster. Boyden of Cambridge, no. Brady of Williston, no. Brannigan of Georgia, yes. Brennan of Colchester, Brown of Richmond, no. Brownell of Pownall, yes. Rumstead of Shelburne, no. Burdett of West Rutland, no. Burke of Brattleboro, no. Burroughs of West Windsor, no. Bus of Woodstock, no. Campbell of St. Johnsbury, no. Canfield of Fairhaven, yes. Carpenter of Hyde Park, Carol Bennington, no. Casey Montpelier, no. Chapin East Montpelier, no. Chase Chester, no. Chase Colchester, no. Chestnut Tangerman of Middletown Springs, no. Christy of Hartford, no. Chena of Burlington, yes. Clifford of Rutland City, yes. Coffee of Guilford, no. Cole of Hartford, no. Conlon of Cornwall, no. Corcoran of Bennington, no. Cordes of Lincoln, Damar of Enosburg, Demro of Corinth, no. Dickinson of St. Ahmed's Town, no. Dodge of Essex, Dolan of Essex Junction, no. Dolan of Waitsfield, no. Donahue of Northfield, yes. Durfee of Shaftesbury, no. Elder Starksboro, no. Emmons of Springfield, no. Farley's Rubio of Barnett, no. Galfetti of Barrytown, yes. Garifano of Essex, Goldman of Rockingham, no. Ghostland of Northfield, yes. Graham of Williamstown, yes. Granning of Jericho, no. Gregoire of Fairfield, yes. Hango of Berkshire, yes. Harrison of Chittenden, no. Hedrick of Burlington, yes. Higley of Lowell, yes. Holcomb of Norwich, no. Hooper of Randolph, no. Hooper of Burlington, no. Houghton of Essex Junction, no. Howard of Rutland City, Hammond of South Burlington. No. James of Manchester. No. Jerome of Brandon. No. Kornheiser of Brattleboro. Krasnow of South Burlington. Labor of Morgan. No. Labalty of Linden. No. Lally of Shelburne. No. Lalone of South Burlington. No. Lamont of Morristown. Lanford of Regens. La Russia Franklin. Love to Grand Isle. No. Lipsky of Stowe. Yes. Logan of Burlington. Long of New Fame. No. McGuire of Rutland City. No. Marcotte of Coventry. Yes. Maslin of Thetford. No. Matos of Milton. Yes. McCann of Montpelier. No. McCarthy of St. Albans City. No. McCoy of Poultney. Yes. McFawn of Berrytown. Yes. McGill of Birdport. Mahali of Callis, Minier of South Burlington, yes. Morgan of Milton, Morse of Springfield, yes. Morsey of Bennington, Rewicki of Putney, yes. Mulvaney Stanick of Burlington, Nicole of Ludlow, no. Nod of Rutland City, no. Noise of Volkett, Nugent of South Burlington, yes. O'Brien of Tunbridge, no. Odie of Burlington, no. Oliver of Sheldon, Page of Newport City, no. Paella of Londonderry, no. Parsons of Newberry, yes. Pat of Worcester, no. Pearl of Danville, Peterson of Clarendon, yes. 
Pouch of Hinesburg? No. Priestley of Bradford? No. Quimby of Linden? Yes. Rachel Center of Burlington? Yeah. Rice of Dorset? Yeah. I'm sorry, Rice of Dorset. No. Thank you. Roberts of Halifax? No. Sam Castleton? Yes. Sackowitz of Randolph? No. Shia Middlebury? No. Shaw of Pittsburgh? Yes. Sheldon of Middlebury? No. Sibelia of Dover? Yes. Sims of Craftsbury? Small of Anuski. Yes. Smith of Derby. Yes. Squirrel of Underhill. Yes. Stebbins Burlington. Yes. Stevens of Waterbury. Yes. Stone of Burlington. Yes. Supernaut of Barnard. Taylor of Milton. Yes. Taylor of Colchester. Yes. Templeman of Brownington. Yes. Selena of Bradborough. Yes. Tufa of St. Albans Town. Yes. Tory of Moortown. Yes. Triana of Standard. Yes. Walker of Swanton, no. Waters Evans of Charlotte, no. White of Bethel, no. Whitman of Bennington, no. Williamsbury City, no. Williams Granby, Wood of Waterbury, and Triano of Orwell, Howard of Rutland City, Krasnod of South Burlington, Lamont of Morristown, Logan of Burlington, Morgan of Milton, Homvaney Stanek of Burlington, Pearl of Danville, Supernana Barnard, Williams of Granby, what about it, Ray? For purpose of explanation, member from St. Albans Town. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I vote yes for transparency for our constituents and our house budget. Members, please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 41. Those voting no, 97. The nays have it, and you have declined to amend the bill. Please listen to the third reading of the bill. H 883, an act relating to making appropriations for the support of government. The question is, shall the bill pass? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have passed the bill. Members, uh, just a reminder of order here. We are now turning to H875, followed by S278, and then h 876. So House Bill 875 is an act relating to the State Ethics Commission and State Code of Ethics. The bill was introduced by the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. The member from Charlotte, Representative Waters Evans, will speak for the committee. In carrying an appropriation, the bill was referred to the Committee on Appropriations, which recommends that the bill ought to pass when amended in, as printed in today's calendar. The member from Waitsfield, Representative Dolan, will speak for that committee. Please listen to the second reading of the bill. H-875, an act relating to the State Ethics Commission and the State Code of Ethics. Member from Charlotte. Finally. Madam Speaker, H-875 
is an act relating to the State Ethics Commission and the State Code of Ethics. It's a committee bill, and it can be found on the House Government Operations and Military Affairs uh, webpage. Uh, this bill continues the work that the General Assembly began in 2017 with the passage of Act 79, which established the State Ethics Commission, and then furthered that work in 2022 when we established the State Code of Ethics, which covers us in the General Assembly as well as the executive branch and statewide elected officials. Ethics, by its nature, can be subjective, but from the smallest town in Vermont to the biggest city, and from a lone town employee to the highest offices in the state, we can all agree that transparency and accountability in government and by those who govern is what makes Vermonters trust those systems. And trust is essential between elected officials and the people who elected them in the first place. It's how we do good work. A lot of people's first reaction when they hear a code of ethics is to think, I'm going to get in trouble. Or people are going to try to catch me doing something wrong and I'm not doing anything wrong. That's not the purpose of an ethics policy and it's not the intent of the bill. The intent is to hold elected officials accountable in many ways to themselves. It's also going to help Vermonters maintain local control over their local governments while at the same time providing an unbiased, nonpartisan outlet for ethics concerns for both elected officials and the people they represent. Again, the goal is not to get elected officials in trouble, nor is it to remove local control. Vermont currently has some of the least stringent ethics laws in the country. This bill would take several steps forward to align our laws with our true inherent spirit of openness and transparency. We're special here in Vermont, but we're not immune from the human condition. Okay, so there are essentially two parts to H7, 875. There's a state ethics miscellaneous portion and a municipal ethics portion. I'm gonna go through this section by section, but some sections contain technical corrections or have repetitive language from other statutes and don't contain new information, so you're welcome, I'm going to skip those. So section one. When candidates run for state office or the state legislature, they fill out campaign finance disclosure forms. There are also disclosures required periodically throughout an elected official's term. This section adds county officers to the list of candidates who need to file campaign finance disclosures. So a county official or county office in this case would be a state's attorney, a sheriff, assistant superior court judge, probate judge, and high bailiff. Just to note, um, once a judge is elected, they are subject to, um, because of a separation of powers, they have the judiciary branch has different um, ethics policies that they take care of themselves. Okay, so section one also adds the list of required financial disclosures. This is the part that we all do when we fill out that yellow form on the Secretary of State's website. It adds to the list of financial disclosures the name of any clients known to the candidate or their domestic partner whose principal business activities are regulated by a municipal or state office, department or agency, or who have a contract with one of those entities just within the previous 12 months, as long as that information isn't confidential. It also asks for the details of any loan made to a company of the candidate or their spouse or domestic partner that's not a commercially, commercially reasonable loan or the name of any company in which the candidate or their spouse or domestic partner has ownership or controlling interest if that company had business before or with a state or municipal office agency or department. Okay, please note here. The phrase known to the candidate is really important here. The bill doesn't require a candidate to call up their clients or their spouse or their domestic partner's clients to ask about all of their business activities. It just requires disclosure if the candidate knows about those loans or contracts at the time of filing. When they're sitting there at the computer filling out the form, if they know, then they disclose it. Okay, so two things are important to remember here. First, when we're talking about the disclosure, again, we're talking about the form. Everyone in this chamber, of course, has filled out the current, very limited disclosure form before. It's fairly simple. 
and this bill just adds a few things to it. The form and its contents will be stored and available to the public just as it is now. The second thing to remember is that finance disclosures aren't intended to be a situation where someone is busted for doing something they shouldn't. On the contrary, it gives a candidate a moment to reflect on their potential conflicts of interest as they fill out their forms. And second, the very nature of disclosing a potential conflict takes some teeth out of it by merely acknowledging its existence. Okay, back to section one. A few more things are added to the required disclosures that apply to the candidates and their spouse or domestic partner. Uh, one is a description of publicly traded assets but not the amount over which they have individual control that are valued at $25,000 or more. Interest in investment funds that are valued at $25,000 or more, or interests in trusts valued at $25,000 or more, plus uh, municipal bonds in any amount issued in the state of Vermont. Um, just to note that first one, the individual uh, assets of $25,000 or more, um, no one needs to disclose a specific amount. And it only applies to um, investments over which the candidate has specific control over it. So if you owned, let's say, we'll just say Apple stock, if you have $25,001 invested in Apple stock, or you could have $25 million invested in Apple stock, that would be very exciting for you, but you don't need to tell anybody what the amount is. All you have to disclose is the name of that individual stock. If it's just one investment that you have control over, it just, if it's over $25,000, just the name of that holding. That's it. No amounts. Okay. Sections two through four uh, specify definitions of terms used throughout the bill. Uh, section five establishes the aforementioned disclosure requirements as part of an executive or county officer's annual disclosure requirement. And uh, section six of interest maybe to some people in this room is all about filing deadlines and what happens if a candidate doesn't file their disclosure forms on time, which I'm sure would never happen. Okay, let's say a candidate misses their filing deadline. The Secretary of State will notify the State Ethics Commission, who will in turn notify the candidate in writing. So following the issuance of that notice, the candidate has five working days to make a right file their forms. If they don't do it within that five day or within that time period, the five working days after they get the notice, starting at six working days, then the candidate will pay ten dollars a day in a fine until they file or until they reach a thousand dollars. This bill also works in a provision for the Ethics Commission to waive the penalties should circumstances require. That would be if something unusual happened that prevented the candidate from filing or if the website went down or something like that. There's, it's, uh, there, there are ways to, to waive that fee. Um, there is no further action after the $1,000 limit is reached. There are no further consequences, just uh, your inner shame of knowing that you didn't fulfill your legal obligation to file your campaign finance forms on time. Okay, section seven expands the State Ethics Commission's powers. The bill gives the commission the authority to investigate, to hold hearings, to issue warnings and reprimands, and to recommend actions relating to the ethics complaints. So sections nine and 10 lay out the following procedural rules for handling these complaints. Okay, first, anyone about whom a complaint is made will start by consulting with the executive director of the Ethics Commission within 60 days of receiving a complaint. The executive director of the State Ethics Commission can only initiate an investigation with a majority vote of non-recused members of the commission. So it's not at somebody's whim. There needs to be a vote of the commission. Okay, there's a two-year statute of limitations for complaints, and any investigation that's started will be concluded within six months of its inception. The complainant and the person about whom the complaint was made will both participate in the process and both have the right to be heard. 
to proceed to the next step, which is a hearing, the executive director needs to determine that there's a reasonable basis to believe that a violation occurred. And then finally, if this is determined, then the entire commission votes on whether or not a hearing is warranted. So there are multiple steps to get to an official hearing in this situation. Um, so now we're on section 11. It's about the hearing process. A couple notable details from this section include the following. So it does grant the State Ethics Commission the power to hold hearings, and they are allowed to ex enter executive session to protect the involved party's confidentiality if need be. Okay, now we're on section 12. This details what happens after the State Ethics Commission has reached the conclusion that unethical behavior has occurred. Okay, so it gives the State Ethics Commission the power to issue warnings, reprimands, and recommended actions. These could include facilitated mediation, further training or education on this specific topic if need be, um, a referral to counseling or another wellness support, or other remedial actions that, that they could find um, appropriate in that situation. So in making their determination, the State Ethics Commission will consider the circumstances of the incident, its severity, the timeline over which it occurred, and the duration of the unethical behavior, and whether or not it happened more than once or as part of a pattern. The State Ethics Commission will keep in mind privacy, rights, and responsibilities of the parties as it makes these determinations. Uh, the State Ethics Commission's determination will be evidence-based and must meet the burden of proof. Nothing is happening willy-nilly here. There's got to be based on facts. And if the commission determined that there was no unethical conduct, they will issue a statement to that effect. Um, and they are required to make a decision on a matter within 30 days of the last hearing on the matter. So these things will not drag on forever. This section also gives the State Ethics Commission the power to enter into resolution agreements with the majority vote to do so, which will include an agreed upon course of action with the public servant or, or official. It'll be in writing. It'll be executed by both the public servant and the executive director. It will also be public record and be treated as such underneath the pub pub Public Records Act. And it could take place at any time during the proceedings. So if you get partway through a hearing and then you decide to reach an agreement, a resolution agreement, it, it would, you know, you could stop the rest of the proceedings. Okay, section 13. This section details the State Ethics Commission's rulemaking procedure and includes the following notable points. First, the Vermont Rules of Civil Procedure and the Vermont Rules of Evidence will apply to the proceedings and the State Ethics Commission and the Executive Director, plus the Commission's legal counsel and investigators, will have the power to administer oaths and issue subpoenas in connection with the hearing. All right, now we're on section 13. This subject has piqued some interest, so if you're curious about confidentiality, now's a good time to pay attention. Not only is the bill not intended to punish or make life difficult for public servants, it helpfully provides a framework to to definitively determine whether or not an ethical violation has occurred. So this section makes sure that public servants' reputations are protected and that they're not victims of frivolous complaints. And also simultaneously make sure the public is getting all the information it has a right to know. So the following are exempt from inspection and copying under the Public Records Act, records relating to the State Ethics Commission's handling of complaints, alleged unethical conduct, investigations, and proceedings. The following are public records under the Public Records Act. That would be investigation records as long as they weren't previously undisclosed during the course of the investigation. Any records that the public servant or their representation would like to disclose, they can share their own records as long as they weren't undisclosed as part of the investigation. Evidence that was included in any public portions of a hearing or warnings, reprimands, recommendations, executed resolution agreements, court orders, or records that support such actions as determined by the State Ethics Commission. All right, now we're on section 15. This adds a member to the State Ethics Commission who is appointed by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. All right, moving ahead to section 19. This section is about data collection. What is a bill without a report? 
the State Ethics Commission will produce a report annually on or before November 15th and aggregate data from ethics concerns that went to other agencies and departments around the state, including the Attorney General, State's Attorney, Department of Human Resources, State Ethics Panel, House Ethics Panel, Judicial Conduct Board, Professional Responsibility Board, and the Office of the State Court Administrator. It also adds an item to the State Ethics Commission's current report requirement that asks for the number of and a summary of complaints that they received. Okay, now we're moving on to the sections of the bill that cover municipal ethics. If you're curious about how your town or city or village or gore or water district will be affected by this bill, this is the exciting part. This bill places municipal officers under obligation to the state code of ethics. I'm just gonna go back and repeat what I said earlier. This bill does not limit or remove local control, it does not give the State Ethics Commission the ability to supplant a municipality's authority in any way. It does not give the Ethics Commission any avenue toward removing someone from office, imposing their will on a municipal government, or restricting the democratic process on a municipal level in any way. Okay, that's, this is mostly, the next part is all section 22. Um, it starts, it goes over some definitions of the various terms we're using. Most of them are standard and familiar, but in this case, we're gonna talk a lot about municipal officers. So um, I think the definition provides some good context here. So it's a municipal officer is defined as a member of a legislative body of a municipality, a member of a quasi-judicial body of a municipality, an individual who, as part of their official municipal duties, exercises authority and discretion in performing any governmental action or function other than only in a clerical, secretarial, or ministerial capacity. Um, the following are not considered municipal officers. A member of an advisory body of a municipality, so maybe that would be like a conservation commission or something, or an individual who, as part of their official municipal duties, performs government actions or functions only in a clerical, secretarial, or ministerial capacity. So there have been uh, some questions about various uh, town positions. So this is sort of laying out very clearly that the teenage lifeguard at the town pool wouldn't be subject to the code of ethics or you know, the person who empties the recycling bins or something like that. It's not every single person or volunteer who's involved in their town's government or its functions. Okay, this section also defines a conflict of interest and explains how it relates to the duties of a municipal officer, specifically the need to avoid not only a conflict of interest, but the appearance of one. Although conflict of interest could be in the eye of the beholder, this bill clarifies that it would count as appearing to be one if a reasonable person with relevant facts would find it to be so. Okay, so this is what happens. If a municipal officer identifies a conflict, they must recuse themselves immediately from the matter, not only for making decisions in their official role, but from influencing the decisions of others or acting on it in any way. The exception to this would be if the officer does continue to participate in a way that's acting as a private citizen not in their capacity as a municipal officer. So keep, this is keeping in mind the fact that we're often applying this concept to small towns, uh, close-knit communities of Vermonters who are drawn to public service in many ways and um, or multiple roles in their communities or who, as it happens frequently, you know, if you're in a smaller town or even a larger town, if you're related or married to someone who serves in those roles, this bill makes room for an officer to continue in a potentially conflicted situation if the conflict is amorphous, intangible, or otherwise speculative. The person can't legally or practically delegate the matter to someone else, like if they're the only town employee or if they're the only person in the village with a snowplow or something else, Vermonty like that, which occurs quite often around here. The action to be taken by the officer is purely ministerial. It does involve substantive decision making. And the officer submits a written statement explaining why they can't recuse themselves to the legislative body of the municipality regarding the nature of the conflict. Okay. 
Now we're moving on to subsection 1994, which if you're lost, it starts at uh, in page 45 of the bill. This is about advisory opinions. So the executive director and the state ethics commission can provide official guidance and advisory opinions only to municipal officers and those covered by the code. And then only pertaining to the specific circumstances that are covered by the code that have to do with their, their job or their role as a municipal officer. Um, any information relating to an advisory opinion or guidance is made public without identifying details and exi is exempt from the Public Records Act. So if a member of the public contacts the Ethics Commission with a concern about a municipal officer, unlike if the municipal officer is requesting guidance on their own, um, the State Ethics Commission is quite limited in what they can do. Uh, mostly they can offer advice, they can say yes, that does sound like a potential conflict, you should go talk to your municipal government and let them know your concerns. A municipal government will have in place a, a process to deal with ethics uh, complaints or questions, so they will, should be able to handle that on their own. Or the State Ethics Commission can say something along the lines of, that's unfortunate, it's too bad, doesn't sound like an ideal situation, but it also doesn't seem like it's an ethics violation. Um, so that's it. They can't pursue the matter further in any way, and they won't. They don't have the authority to do that. Subsection 1995 is about ethics training and the town liaison. So municipal officers will have to complete a training that covers specific topics designated by the State Ethics Commission. The state currently, like right now, the State Ethics Commission provides ethics training. The Vermont Leagues of Cities and Towns provides ethics trainings. And some municipalities even have their own ethics training programs, which are totally fine to continue as long as they receive approval from the Ethics Commission. It doesn't matter where the training comes from as long as it meets the minimum requirements set forth by the State Ethics Commission and receives approval. So we'd have to meet those minimum standards that are, that are put in place by the State Ethics Commission. The bill specifies that the commission's approval of those other ethics trainings shouldn't be unreasonably withheld. In other words, they can't make it onerous for municipality to get its training approved. The bill requires that training is completed within 120 days of the person taking office. If a person doesn't or refuses to complete the training, that's on them. There is nothing the state can do to enforce the training requirements. If a town has its own training that goes way above and beyond the minimum requirements, that is delightful, they are amazing, that town gets a gold star, they just have to check in with the State Ethics Commission first to make sure they've met those minimum requirements. Um, also, each municipality will be required to appoint an ethics liaison. So this person could be, or should be, um, a municipal employee, but sometimes there are no municipal employees. Um, so if there aren't any employees, they can be a member of the municipality's governing body. So a select board or city council or what have you. All right, this is what the ethics liaison will be, re will be required to do. There are two things. First, they will complete the ethics training or education as requested by the Ethics Commission. And second, they will report the names of any municipal officers who have also completed their training to the Ethics Commission. And that is what that person will do. Take the ethics training, report the names. There are some other uh, administrative tasks that a town is asked to do. It could make natural sense that the ethics liaison would be also the person to perform this. Um, but I, it's not required. So now we're on subsection 1997. And in addition to training and appointing a liaison, they will have to, um, among some other administrative uh, tasks, they will have to maintain a record of municipal officials who have received ethics training. They will designate a municipal officer or body to receive complaints alleging violations of the Municipal Code of Ethics. So this could be the ethics liaison, but it doesn't have to be. So where appropriate or necessary, they investigate complaints 
that allege violations of the Municipal Code of Ethics. Okay, so please note in the bill, this clarifies that not every single complaint needs to be vigorously investigated um, and that frivolous or unfounded complaints need to be entertained in any fashion. It's, um, the, it, they also need to maintain a record of received complaints, the disposition of each complaint made against a municipal officer for the duration of that municipal officer's service plus a minimum of five years after. And um, also upon request of the State Ethics Commission, they have to provide a summary of complaints received by the municipality and the outcome of the complaint without uh, personally identifiable information. So it maintains confidentiality. Um, I just want to touch back on the, the part about um, municipalities investigating uh, complaints that language is when appropriate or necessary. So that gives some leeway to uh, the municipality about whether or not it is appropriate or necessary to investigate something. Okay. And that's it for that section. Oh, there's one more thing. The section also provides whistleblower protection for any complainants. It includes language that allows the whistleblower should certain criteria be met to bring a civil action suit against a municipality and or a municipal officer. At first listen, this might seem like an open invitation to a big pile of frivolous, vengeful lawsuits, but that is not, and here is why. These criteria need to be met. First, the complainant needs to have informed the public body in writing of their issue at the time of its discovery. Second, that disclosure needs to have included details about alleged conduct that showed fraud, abuse of authority, law violations, or ethics code violations. And the notice needs to take place, that complainant's notice, needs to take place within a year of the incident's discovery or three years since it happened, whichever is earlier. So there are guidelines in place to uh, make sure that these... Um, that these ethics uh, code violation complaints are made in good faith. All right, now we're on subsection 1998. It adds a little nugget for municipalities that already have uh, their own ethics policies. They can adopt all the additional ethics policies, trainings, uh, meetings, whatever they wanna do, as long as it's not in conflict with what's been set forth in this bill and statute. They can go above and beyond as much as they want. They just have to meet those minimum requirements. All right, we're almost done. So now we're on section 23. It requires that current municipal officers complete an initial training. So if when the bill passes, they, are, um, they have not taken said training, they just have to complete it by May 1st, 2025. And here we go, the act takes effect upon passage uh, with these exceptions. Section one, which covers candidate financial disclosures, takes effect on January 1st, 2026. Section seven through 14, which cover the expansion of the State Ethics Commission's powers, take effect on January 1st, 2025. Your House Gov Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs heard from many witnesses. Some of them multiple times. Here they are, the city manager from South Burlington, the executive director of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, general counsel from the governor's office, a select board member from Lunenburg, retired executive director of the Connecticut Office of State Ethics, select board member from the town of Colchester, clerk treasurer from Barry City, the co-chair of the Vermont Municipal Clerks and Treasurer's Association Legislative Committee, Legislative Council from the Office of Legislative Council, the commissioner of the Vermont State Ethics Commission, the chair of the Vermont State Ethics Commission, town manager from the town of Colchester, the city manager from Montpelier, a city councilor from the city of Essex Junction, deputy, deputy secretary of state from the secretary of state's office, a consultant from the Vermont State Ethics Commission, select board chair from the town of Colchester, a democracy advocate from the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, select board member from Charlotte, the acting chair of the Colchester Board of Ethics in the town of Colchester, the executive director of the Vermont State Ethics Commission, and a former senator from Wyndham County. 
The bill passed favorably out of committee with a vote of 10 to you, and we respectfully ask for your support. And now speaking for the Committee on Appropriations, member from Waitsfield. Madam Speaker, your House Appropriations Committee thanks the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs for bringing us H-875, an act relating to State Ethics Commission and the State Code of, uh, Code of Ethics. The House Appropriations Committee offers one instance of amendment regarding Section 17 that references positions in the fiscal year 25 general fund appropriations that support those uh, positions for the State Ethics Commission. The amendment can be found on page uh, 2905 in today's calendar. This instance of amendment strikes Section 17 in its entirety. The House Committee on Appropriations favorably recommends that H-875 ought to pass as amended by the House Committee on Appropriations on a vote of 8-4-0 and asks for the body support. Member from Charlotte. Madam Speaker, your House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs um, in a straw poll of 9-1-2 um, are in favor of the Appropriations Amendment. So the question is, shall the bill be amended as recommended by the Committee on Appropriations? Are you ready for the question? If so, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have amended the bill. Now the member from Colchester, Representative Brennan, offers an amendment that is printed in today's calendar. Member from Colchester. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The amendment I'm offering today is you can find on today's uh, uh, calendar on page 2905. Members, I offer this amendment today on H70, H. 875 on behalf of the town of Colchester, as well as the other towns in Vermont that, that have already adopted a robust ethics policy. First, part of my amendment in section 22, it's chapter 60, sub 1998, adds section C and D to that section, and I'll, I'll read C and D. A municipality shall be exempt from the entirety of this chapter upon submitting a letter from its legislative body to the State Ethics Commission by December 31st of each year, certifying that the municipality has adopted an ethics policy and framework that does not conflict with the provisions of this chapter. Section D, the State Ethics Commission may provide municipalities not exempted pursuant to subsection C of this section a model ethics policy or other resources. That is the entirety of my amendment. I ask for your support for this amendment on behalf of all the cities and towns in Vermont that have completed the hard work to adopt robust ethics policies. And Madam Speaker, given the impacts of this bill, that, that this bill will have on local control and communities across Vermont, I ask that when the vote on this amendment be taken, it be taken by roll. The member from Colchester requests that when the vote is taken, it be taken by roll. Is the member sustained? The member is sustained. When the vote is taken, it will be taken by roll. Member from Charlotte. Madam Speaker, your House Government Operations and Military Affairs um, on a vote of 831 found this amendment to be unfavorable, and we ask for your support. The member from St. Albans City. So Madam Speaker, I want to express thanks to the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee for really digging into what ethics is about and the way that the State Ethics Commission would be the keeper of the Municipal Code of Ethics, but that municipalities would still be the ones who administer and hear complaints and decide what to do about those complaints. We worked very hard in this bill to make sure that it maintains the control over the most important parts of 
actually hearing complaints about ethics and dealing with them at the local level as it should be. The challenge that we have is, are we going to say that all towns are at least going to have a floor? Are they going to have, a, are we going to have in Vermont a common adopted set of, of ethics policies and then train to those policies um, and that there would be communication back and forth between the State Ethics Commission as ethics policies evolve, as municipalities develop their own trainings, that the State Ethics Commission could be a good resource for the municipalities across the state. We had robust discussions about that. For communities like Colchester, like South Burlington that we heard from that have very robust existing ethics policies, I think actually there will be very, very little change. We even said uh, to the delegation from Colchester, they kind of get a gold star. They're doing a great job right now. <laughs> the challenge with this amendment though, is it would allow municipalities to essentially adopt a completely different ethics policy that may not necessarily include everything. So the language of not in conflict with um, leaves open the path to leave out sections of the Municipal Code of Ethics um, and also to uh, would create potentially a patchwork where Vermonters go to the Ethics Commission and it becomes very difficult for the Ethics Commission to even say uh, what the rules are in that particular municipality. Um, so I, I wanted to ask the body um, to respect the, the work that we did. I want to thank the member from Colchester uh, for bringing this to us. I really understand the spirit of it. I think we made a lot of great decisions that will preserve municipal control and powers where it needs to be preserved, uh, but that this particular amendment just goes one step further and would undermine the good work that we were trying to do. So I'd ask the body to please vote no on this am amendment. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Colchester? Are you ready for the question? If so, will the clerk please call the roll? Andrew, Andrews Westford. Two minutes.
Will the House please come to order and members kindly take their seats? Will the House please come to order? I would like to remind members that we are in the middle of a roll call vote. Members and guests are prohibited from using computers, phones, or any type of electronic device. Please refrain from the passing of notes and conversation during a roll call. When the clerk calls your name, please answer in a loud and clear voice so the clerk can accurately record your vote. The question is, shall the bill be amended as offered by the member from Colchester? Will the clerk please continue to call the roll? Andriano of Orwell. Anthony of Barry City. No, with the explanation. Harrison of Wethersfield. Yes. Arsenal of Williston. No. Austin of Colchester. No. Bartholomew of Heartland. No. Bartley of Fairfax. Yes. Beck of St. Johnsbury. No. Rebecca of Winooski. No. Byrong of Regens. No. Black of Essex. No. Bloomley of Burlington. No. Bongarts of Manchester. No. Bosnell of Westminster. Boyden of Cambridge, no. Brady of Williston, no. Brannigan of Georgia, yes. Brennan of Colchester, yes. Brown of Richmond, no. Brown of Pennell, yes. Rumstead of Shelburne, yes. Burdett of West Rutland, yes. Burke of Brattleboro, no. Burroughs of West Windsor, no. Bus of Woodstock, no. Campbell of St. Johnsbury, no. Canfield of Fairhaven, yes. Carpenter of Hyde Park, Carol Bennington. No. Casey Montpelier. No. Chapin East Montpelier. No. Chase of Chester. No. Chase of Colchester. No. Chestnut Tangerman of Middletown Springs. No. Christy of Hartford. Uh, yes. Chena of Burlington. No. Clifford of Rutland City. Yes. Coffee of Guilford. No. Cole of Hartford. Conlon of Cornwall. No. Corcoran of Bennington. Yes. Cordes of Lincoln. No. Damar of Enosburg. Yes. Demro of Corinth. No. Dickinson of St. Albans Town. Yes. Dodge of Essex. Dolan of Essex Junction. No. Dolan of Waitsfield. No. Donahue of Northfield. Yes. Durfee of Shaftesbury. No. Elder of Starksboro. No. Emmons of Springfield. Carlis Rubio of Barnet. No. Galfetti of Barrytown. Yes. Garifano of Essex. No. Goldman of Rockingham. No. Ghostland of Northfield. Yes. Graham of Williamstown. No. Granning of Jericho. No. Gregoire of Fairfield. Yes. Hango of Berkshire. Yes. Harrison of Chittenden. No. Hedrick of Burlington. No. Higley of Lowell. Holcomb of Norwich, no. Hooper of Randolph, no. Hooper of Burlington, no. Houghton of Essex Junction, no. Howard of Rutland City, Hammond of South Burlington, no. James of Manchester, no. Jerome of Brandon, no. Kornheiser of Brattleboro, no. Kresna of South Burlington, Labor of Morgan, no. Labounty of Linden, no. Lally of Shelburne, Lalonde of South Burlington. No. Lamont of Morristown. Lanford of Virgins. No. LaRussia Franklin. No. Levitt of Grand Isle. No. Lipsky of Stowe. No. Logan of Burlington. Long of Newfane. No. McGuire of Rutland City. No. Marcotte of Coventry. Yes. Mazin of Thetford. No. Matos of Milton. Yes. McCann of Montpelier. No. McCarthy of Sandbone City. McCoy of Pulteney. Yes. McFawn of Berrytown. Yes. McGill of Bridport. No. Mahali of Callis. No. Minnie of South Burlington. Yes. Morgan of Milton. Morse of Springfield. Yes. Morsey of Bennington. Yes. Rowicki of Putney. No. Mulvaney Stanick of Burlington. Nicole of Ludlow. No. Not of Rutland City. No. Noise of Wolcott. Nugent of South Burlington. O'Brien and Tunbridge, no. Odie of Burlington, no. Oliver of Sheldon, yes. Page of Newport City, no. Payala of Londonderry, yes. Parsons of Newberry, yes. 
Hat of Worcester. Pearl at Inville. Peterson and Clarendon. Houch of Hinesburg. Priestley of Bradford. Quimby of Linden. Rachelson of Burlington. Rice of Dorset. Roberts of Halifax. Samus of Castleton. Sackowitz of Randolph. Shy of Middlebury. Shaw of Pittsford. Sheldon of Middlebury. Sibelia of Dover. Sims of Craftsbury. No. Small of Winooski. No. Smith of Derby. No. Squirrel of Underhill. No. Stephens of Burlington. No. Stevens of Waterbury. No. Stone of Burlington. No. Supernon of Barnard. Taylor Milton. Taylor of Colchester. No. Templeman of Brownington. Yes. Tolina of Brattleboro. No. Tufa St. Owens Town. Yes. Tory Moore Town. Troyana of Stannard. Walker of Swanton. Waters Evans of Charlotte. No. White of Bethel. No. Women of Bennington. No. Williamsbury City. No. Williams of Granby. Wood of Waterbury. Howard of Rutland City. Krasnow South Burlington. Lamont of Morristown. Logan of Burlington, Morgan of Milton, Mulvaney Stanick of Burlington, Pearl of Danville, Supernaut of Barnard, Troyano of Stannard, Williams of Granby, Wood of Waterbury. For purpose of explanation, member from Berry City. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I voted no only because of the absence of equivalence language, which could have gotten a rev an opposite response. Thanks. Member from Swanton. Madam Speaker, it's always interesting to me when we believe in local control and when we don't. Thank you. Member from Brownington. You may. Templeman of Brownington. No. Member from Hartford. Madam Speaker, I'd like to change my vote. You may. Christy of Hartford. No. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. Madam Speaker, I vote no. All towns should have the benefit of a common starting point and support from the State Ethics Commission on the new Municipal Code of Ethics. Member from Jericho. Madam Speaker, may I explain my vote? You may. When we create a system to ensure ethical behavior and allow for self-certification of compliance, we open the door to misuse and even abuse. Members, please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting yes, 43. Those voting no, 95. The nays have it, and you have declined to amend the bill. Members, before we recess, I'm going to entertain a motion from the member from Shelburne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that we suspend the rules to interrupt the orders of the day for the purpose of introductions. The member from Shelburne moves that we suspend our rules um, in, in order to um, interrupt orders of the day for the purpose of announcements. Are you ready for the question? If so, 
All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have suspended our rules in order to interrupt orders of the day for the purpose of introductions and announcements. Member from Shelburne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today is a special day for Vermont's disability communion, uh, community. I hope that you take a moment today to say hello and join me in welcoming the disability advocates from all over Vermont that are here in the building with us today. Will the guest of the member from Shelburne please rise if you're able and be recognized. Are there any further announcements? Member from Newfane. Madam Speaker, the House Democrats will caucus um, at 1 p.m. in the House chamber. That is a different location than normal, but I just want to make sure you all know. In the House chamber at 1 p.m., Democrats will caucus. Thank you. Are there any further announcements? Member from Essex. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as a member of the Transportation Committee, um, I wanted to um, take a moment um, to uh, recognize and commemorate the workers who were caught um, unaware when a massive tanker crashed into um, the, the um, supports of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Francis Scott Key, in case we didn't know, is the author of the lyrics for the Star Spangled Banner. Ironically, he was also an anti-abolitionist and slaveholder. Uh, obviously, there's a tremendous economic cost for uh, a bridge into Baltimore, um, but the human cost is not lost on me. Um, 40 percent of the construction workers in the Baltimore area are immigrants. 40 percent of construction workers in the Baltimore area are immigrants. At 1.30 a.m., when these men were warming up in their trucks, on break at 1.30 a.m. Word never got to them while the May Day came from the boat to law enforcement that worked to clear traffic from the bridge. The foreman did not get the word to the men who were trying to warm up their bodies and take a break from a cold night of work. Two bodies were recovered from a red pickup truck 25 feet underwater. And there are at least four more missing. Madam Speaker, may I read the names of the victims? You may. Alejandro Hernández Fuentes of Mexico, Dorlian Ronial Castillo Cabrera of Guatemala are the victims that have been found. Young, hardworking parents who came to make a better life, not just for themselves, but for all of us. Miguel Luna of El Salvador is still missing. Minor Yacir Suazo Sandoval is still missing from Honduras. Jose Lopez from Mexico. 
These folks are always nameless, so I'm really grateful that you allowed me to say their names in this body. Remember, we keep the, the, the men and their families in our thoughts and our prayers. Are there any further announcements, member from Burlington? There are a lot of really amazing people in the State House today, and um, I just wanted to talk about one group that's here. Uh, the Vermont Council on World Affairs hosts international visitors from all over the world to foster subnational diplomacy across Vermont. They have a group of visiting fellows who is, they've been here since March 7th and will be here through April 7th. Uh, these 14 young professionals have traveled to Vermont for a four-week fellowship designed to provide substantive short-term work experience that allows them to learn about an issue or topic of interest from a U.S. Vermont perspective, produce work products, um, and get exposure to U.S. workplace and organizational culture. They've decided to come to the State House this Friday for their professional Friday. They would be here, but they are with David Sheets um, getting a tour. But if you see them walking around, please welcome them to the People's House. Thanks. Are there any further announcements? The Chair has one. Uh, members, I know we've been working very hard this week, lots of late nights, um, and also have our staff. And so I just want to take a moment um, to thank the incredible staff that we have in this building, uh, those here in front of us and those working throughout the building who've done everything to make sure we can do our job well. Please join me in thanking them. Members, at this time, we are going to recess uh, for lunch, for caucus, for um, some committees are meeting to hear announcements, and so I want to make sure that we have enough time for all of these things to occur. So the House will stand in recess until the fall of the gavel at approximately 5.30.